Welcome back, everybody, to the 2017 SAC Indie Arcade, where we've heard from a lot of great speakers today here in the Black Box Theater at the West Sacramento Community Center. It's part, again, of 2017 SAC Indie Arcade. But uh, sadly, we're, we're down to our last speaker, but I'm very excited to hear from one of the creators of T-Cubed, Chris Sprague, is here with us to talk a little bit about his product, T-Cubed, from concept to paycheck. Everybody, give it up here for Chris. All right, thank you very much. And can you hear this? One more time. All right, so one year ago, as of tomorrow, actually, my co-founders and I launched T-Cube, which is tic-tac-toe on a cube, and we launched it here at SAC Indie Arcade. And since that year has passed, we've actually had a lot of success with it. And we've been asked to talk about how we have been able to make a game that makes money uh, since so many games actually try to get these good ideas out but they never make money on them or they make too little money on them. So to start out with my background I got a BS in aerospace engineering and applied mathematics from CU Boulder and it's a very rigorous and intensive program and it's one of the best in the nation and I have a broad understanding of a lot of technical topics as a result of this. And after I left CU Boulder, I went into the Peace Corps, which just helped me understand how to be resilient in some of the hardest circumstances on Earth. And when I came back from the Peace Corps, I worked for Lockheed Martin, which gave me very good technical training and actual experience under really good engineers. So why do I bring that up? Because I always had a dream of making a robot called the Artificially Intelligent Quarterback. The AIQB is a robot that throws a football to a wide receiver, detects if he caught it or dropped it, and then creates a training routine in order to improve his, uh, on his weaknesses. And at the same time that I was making the AIQB, I was working at Lockheed Martin, and my wife also wanted to pursue her dreams, and so she actually wanted to come here to UC Davis for her PhD. But before you can jump off of making money, you have to ask, is it realistic to actually be an entrepreneur and technically be a, a PhD student, which is also an entrepreneur in their own right. And to determine if it was realistic to pursue our dreams or just to keep kind of hitting the pavement, we looked up what it takes to actually successfully make a company around a product. And we found out what everyone in the room probably does know, that you need funding. You need to be educated in the field you're going um, to create the product in. You need to be experienced and self-motivated. And you really need to really love what you're doing. And what most people think is you have to have a very disruptive idea. And if you look at football right now, the AAQB definitely is a disruptive idea. The best thing they have out right now is two wheels, you push a ball into it, and you still have a person working it. So we had everything in line. It sounded like a really good idea to start spending our savings on entrepreneurship. The problem is that even though we built the AAQB, or most of the AAQB, after about a year and a half, we recognized that Funding a robot with this kind of sophistication is very expensive and is way more expensive than we had planned out. And if we didn't stop burning through cash at the rate that it took, we were just going to go broke. So we went ahead and we took the software from the AIQB and created an educational app, uh, interestingly, called Kufuma. Well, sorry. Kufuma also took two years of my time and had so many features and got so bloated that it actually just kept pushing the release date farther and farther into the future to where we never actually released it. So we stopped and said, all right, we keep building things that are too sophisticated, too complicated. Uh, let's step back and make something super simple that we can start making money on to actually fund the dream instead of just living off of savings again. So we made pains, which breaks down into just a really way, a cool way of using art to make backgrounds for phones and for everything else. But it was really the mechanism, mechanisms behind the art that made it a neat app. But we also recognized at the time that we need to start planning for me going back to work. And so we put up hover droids, which was just basically me putting my code online to demonstrate that I can actually be an Android developer professionally because I was self-taught at this. And in the end, all three of these still failed. And at that point, we took a step back and said, we had the money, we had the experience, we had everything you need, and it's all failing. Why is it failing? And so the first takeaway I want to talk about is 
Throwing resources at something doesn't solve the problem most of the time. If your business isn't failing, if your uh, game isn't getting off the ground, most likely it is not because you don't have the right technical founder or you don't have the most beautiful art um, or you don't have the funding. That genuinely, in my experience, is not what is making it fail. So we knew what wasn't making it fail, but we didn't know how to succeed yet. So we actually went to Startup Hustle with uh, Hacker Lab. And the primary purpose of Startup Hustle is to step back and just focus on customers instead of your product. And so we said, all right, let's, let's not look at any of the things we've done. Let's take some idea that you can detach emotionally, which we took tic-tac-toe, and let's get customers to tell us how they'll change tic-tac-toe in order to want to pay for it. And so we just did customer survey after customer survey after customer survey. We literally had people play tic-tac-toe. Then they said, hey, let's put tic-tac-toe on a cube. And then let's take that tic-tac-toe and uh, add some other strategic elements to it. And we got to our first MVP at a dollar from the dollar store. And this is literally what it looks like. And this is actually what we brought last year to Sack and Arcade 2016. And you'll notice that it's super simple and it is missing what, are, what we call arrows and portals. So we, we played this over and over and over and found out that it's just tic-tac-toe on six sides and it's very boring. And we asked people why it was boring and they said, well, because every user's move is completely independent of all the other user's moves. You need to be able to tie one user movement into the next. And so we added arrows and portals so that whenever you moved, it dictated where your opponent can go and so on and so on until you win the game. And so if you look over on your right side, you'll actually be able to see the arrows. So if you mark that X where the arrow is, it tells your opponent to go to the next side. And so every single move you make forces your opponent to a different side. That simple addition made this game wildly popular. And I'm not saying it personally. Like I'm actually not attached to this game. I like it and I think it's cool we built it. But people get really excited about it and they... they they start playing a couple rounds thinking it's tic-tac-toe and immediately you can see when they got it that this is strategy and you need strategy and this is really cool. Um, and in the middle, you can see my other co-founder and I leave. This is T-Cubed and T-Cubed Electronic because people consistently told us not only do they want to be able to have an acrylic version they can mark on, but they want one that actually has LEDs that you can light up. So we said, all right, might just make a little electronic version. And then we kept asking and asking and asking, and people said, yeah, this electronic version is cool, but I would actually just buy T-Cubed on acrylic if you just made it look nice, and I'd buy it right now. And we recognize that we can fund our entire company $15 at a time if we just stop focusing, focusing on the more technolo technologically advanced um, electronic version and just went with the simple version. And so what we ended up coming up with, with a lot of customer input, is T-Cubed as you see it now. T-Cubed is just a simple acrylic game. It has a marker and rules and it packs down into a box so, so that it's portable. And this is seriously so well loved at this point that I know we've built a great product that has traction that will last. But I want to emphasize that we didn't necessarily build it. We just managed customer input and we managed people's requests in a way that actually fulfilled their need. And so let customers build their own product rather than you deciding what they want. That's not working. All right, so, all right, we got customer input to build a product that they want. So now let's see if they'll actually buy it, right? What did we do to get traction? Um, the first thing we did is we just talked about building it. So I built these out of Hacker Lab. I cut them out on the laser cutter, and I would just post pictures of me cutting them on the laser cutter in the middle of the night. And I did it often enough that people actually started believing we were selling them, and they actually thought we were selling a lot more than we were. And so they came to us and they said, hey, this looks really cool, whatever you're doing. You know, congratulations on the success. What is it exactly, and can I buy it? And we released right before Christmas, and so a lot of people decided that they would like this for themselves and add it as a stocking stuffer because it's just this great product. And so we were able to get into over a third of the United States geographically and Canada in eight weeks before Christmas and including Christmas. And that generated about $4,000 for us and got us our first 67 customers. And so my, my lesson on this one really is 
customers are closer than they appear. And a lot of people think you have to have a strategy. You actually have to have a marketing plan and an email marketing plan and social media. You do not, at least initially. You just need to tell people what you're doing, get them involved continuously. And then those same people that helped you design the product will eventually buy it if you, if you listen to them and, and provide, if you meet their need, basically. And additionally on this, I want to say, a lot of people think that you shouldn't sell to your mom. Your mom has this you know, freebie card that's not a good, that's just not true. And you're going to lose a lot of money thinking that. So my friend called me and he wanted to start a trucking service. And he said, I'm going to give 20 people that I know 75 bucks to test out my trucking service and tell me what they think. And I said, well, who are those people? Oh, they're all people that I know personally. And they love me. Don't you think that they would just give you 75 bucks because they love you, they support you, and they, they want you to succeed? Yeah, I think so. And when he tried it, and guess what? He got all the money that he needed just by asking people to pay for the service and test it out. So your mom, your dad, all these people don't want to invest thousands of dollars into what you do, but they're totally cool giving you 10 bucks for something in return because they believe in you, even if your product sucks. So ask your mom to pay for it. And actually, our mom is one of our biggest customers to this day and keeps giving them out and helps fund the business. So I have a last couple of points that I really want to emphasize um, because I do think getting traction is a lot easier than most marketing makes it sound. First, the, sorry, the fourth takeaway is kissing sells. And for people that don't know what kissing is, it's keep it simple, stupid. And so, what's, <laughs> right? Like, I love it. Um, I thought when I was making the AIQB that I was keeping it simple, as simple as it possibly needed. It's a seven foot robot. Like, that is not simple. <laughs> That is really sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, it's totally opposite. And this is the problem. Like, I'm an engineer. That is a problem with engineers. Simple to us is ridiculously stupid. Like, okay, so what we did is we sold people tic-tac-toe. And if you look up tic-tac-toe items online, there are thousands and thousands of them. And the number of apps that are tic-tac-toe that generate revenue through ads, there are hundreds of them. And so get away from the idea that you need something groundbreaking or earth shattering, like make softer toilet paper and just go sell it. Like that's the main thing you need to do. It doesn't need to be hugely distinctive, honestly. As long as it's simple, you can probably sell it. Uh, the last one I actually get asked about a lot um, is patenting. We released to SAC Indie Arcade is the first public disclosure. We have a year from that date to file a provisional patent application. And if in that year we didn't make money, why would I patent it? If the idea is not worth patenting, it's not going to bring in revenue, cool, don't patent it. it. It really is that simple. And from the time you file your provisional patent application, you have another year to actually file your regular patent application. And my overall point is this. You have two years before you actually need to file a patent. And if you have $15,000 in the bank, you can either use all $15,000 to patent something that the, the, um, your target market hasn't indicated to buy, or you can use that to scale the company, figure out if it'll sell, and then take the money generated, the revenue generated, to then pay for the patent. So please, seriously, it is that easy. Don't spend your money on patenting until you know it'll work. And actually, the last point on this one is, if you look at T-Cubed when it first started, we would have tried to patent tic-tac-toe, right? And then we would have tried to patent what is 3D tic-tac-toe. And it took a lot of iterations to figure out what is patentable about our product. And it's none of that. It's really just kind of the way in which the strategy works. And that's what we patent. And so if we would have wasted money trying to patent something that's just not patentable or that's different than our end product, we also would have just wasted the money uh, so wait until your product has stabilized and it's in the market long enough for you to say, okay, that is what we want to patent. So there are a lot of other takeaways, but I think if you just remember those five, it'll really help you start to gain traction and at least start to generate some revenue. And if you have any more questions about that, I'd like to take them now. Nobody? Nobody? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, with, as you were saying, keeping it simple and coming up with the idea, and as you showed the, you know, don't be afraid of failure, what, what in you kept you focused on the, the end goal? What kept you at your horizon line? I will actually say 
a lot of the time, like looking back 2020 now, I wasn't focused on the end goal. Um, you think you are when you're in it, but you hop around a lot from idea to idea to idea to idea. And a lot of people do this. Um, and you kind of take pride in the fact that you're this ideator. All of the failures that um, we've had finally got me to a point where I just I stopped caring about making anything novel. I stopped caring about anything but making money and paying the bills again. And so now that we have a product that's just constant, I'm able to focus a lot more on this getting out. And there are days that it's still super discouraging because this is still scaling at this point. Um, we're not a million dollar company by any stretch. But what keeps me focused, interestingly, is coming to these kinds of events and just seeing people use it. And because they're still so stoked and so happy, I know that yes, all of the other ideas I wanna make, just ignore them because this one will succeed because I see it on people's faces. Um, I'm also lucky my co-founder is my wife our other co-founder is a good friend of ours and they know how to talk to me and work with me so that I can get my ideas out and that they can constrain that again to what we need to focus on. So SAC Indie Arcade is a big part of it. Um, with Startup Hustle, they said, just go find customers. The first 20 customers you talk to, probably just talk to your friends and your family and stuff. But then find venues where you can find the public audience to test that idea in. And for us, it was SAC Indie Arcade because it's like clear. Uh, there are a lot of our target market here. But from there, we just kept going out to meetups. Uh, Meetup.com is one of the greatest tools ever made for humanity, in my opinion. Just, I'm, I'm dead serious about this. Like, just go to game nights with people, have them play it, don't get defensive, and really let them just, like, molest it into something good because your initial idea probably does suck and you cannot admit it. It's just, like, a pride thing. So meetup.com is another one. Um, I give a lot of presentations, and Concept to Paycheck is one that's consistently uh, requested. And I think it is because it appeals to entrepreneurs, it appeals to gamers, and it allows me to then go to a broad spectrum of, of meetup hosts and they don't want to host it. Like, let me rephrase this. Meetup hosts are always looking for somebody to present because if they don't have someone to present, they have to make the presentations every time. And you're talking about hours and hours, right? To make a presentation. And so I just say, hey, here's my idea. I've done this at these places. Talk to these other meetup groups to see if um, it fits your meetup. I think it does for these reasons. And consistently I've had people just say, yep, come in April, come in March. And you just have to schedule it, you know, a month ahead and you'll find a lot of people you can talk to at one point. One-on-one -on -one is a lot harder. Um, it takes more time, obviously, but then if you have groups, it's also harder to get um, sincere feedback or honest feedback. So you have to balance it out between them. And I guess one of the main tools, regardless of where you're finding this audience to talk to is you have to know how to ask the questions so that you're not gonna get the answer you want. So we started by saying, hey, what do you like about it? And very quickly recognize that no one didn't like it, well, and that's not possible. And so we started just saying, uh, what do you think of it? And then if they say, oh, I really like it, and you say, okay, well, what do you like about it? And you kind of guide them down that path. And then you also make sure to ask something like, well, if you could improve this, how would you improve this? And so it really is just, yeah, those are the avenues and that's how I take the feedback. I haven't actually done anything online and I think it's because T-Cubed, uh, which by the way, if anyone can't see that, um, T-Cubed, what's up? Oh, very nice, very nice. It's hard to see it. Woo! I think half the people in here bought it actually. <laughs> All million of you. Um, well, it's a great product, so why not? Thank you. Yeah, I, I sincerely appreciate that. And that's the thing is people see tic-tac-toe. It's not interesting. It genuinely like they got sick of it when they were seven, but they touch it and they feel it. And, and it's an emotional response from that. And so that's why I think we haven't been able to do online surveys is it's something you have to play with to actually get good feedback. So it kind of is like, uh, like Tetris. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, actually, I think that's a really good example. Right. Well, and it's fun, I should also add the, the it's cool to see that you give it to people and initially people are like, I'm not going to go to, to SIA and play tic-tac-toe and they give you a weird eye and then you get them in and, and they'll play like just two marks and they immediately, you see it on their face. They're like, oh, 
Okay. You need, you need to think this one through to actually win it. And that's what attaches people. Um, and that's the other thing about observing and it, it would be hard to do online. Uh huh. Ooh, I love it. So, I mean, what were your, I guess, decisions whenever you did make the final product? Uh huh. You put a lot of time into, like, color, how it looks, you know, like, how, like, logo looks work. How did that process go? Mm hmm. So, I actually want to go, let's see. I love that whenever you make something, you think it's the coolest thing on earth. Our logo last year was he here at the bottom. And, like, it really is pretty ugly. Um, and I made it, and I know it. And like, once we got the new logo, I'm like, okay, way better. So every single step that you make, even for something simple like this, you've, you have to test it and test it and test it. And so with the colors, it is the only thing that I I went to the, the hardware store and I found three contrasting colors that were bright and it's just literally because my personality, like I like bright colors and so does my, so my co-founders. So I just got three contrasting bright colors and we spray painted it and people liked it. And eventually we got to making the package and this took 30 whatever iterations to make a package. And we initially made one that looked just like this that was a monochrome logo and a black box. And we handed it out to people and very consistently people were like, that looks like a condom box <laughs> and it did it really did so we changed that we said okay that's kind of ridiculous right um, and so we made it white and tricolor and everyone's like yeah that that looks good okay so let's go with the tricolor instead of a monochrome and then we had to change the paint color the blue to match the blue that you can print so that everything was as close as possible color wise across the spectrum um, but other than that the colors we're about the only thing I've ever lucked out on on choosing something right the first time. It yeah, it worked. I, everything else took a lot more iterations. So would you consider this your core oh, absolutely. Yeah. So for those that don't know it, let's see this. This was a mock-up of what we wanted to do with T-Cubed Electronic. Very simple. You touch the side, it lights up the LEDs instead of you marking on it. And as we talk to people, they'd be like, oh, that'd be cool to be able to do A, B, C, D. So we added a Bluetooth speaker. We added sensors. We added um, touch screens. We added all of this stuff so that it then connected to your phone so that your phone could project different types of apps onto this. So rather than just being T-Cube, you could do Snake or you could do Tetris or you could do whatever. Or if you think about it, like Zelda in 6D would be pretty cool going chamber to chamber. And we're like, oh my God, we have this cool, cool, amazing thing. Uh, which basically it's what you see there with a whole lot more componentry inside. And when we were talking to people, we recognized that it's going to be like a two year, three year thing to make that happen realistically. And so we scaled back from that, put all of our efforts into this, and we are legitimately funding a company on a $15 item. And that's why I go back to the point that you do not have to be groundbreaking. And I'm happy that I know this now because this is not groundbreaking. Um, you have a simple derivative of a product that you just start selling and you marketing, market it and you just know who you're selling to and target that and focus on that and put all your efforts into that and not into the product modification. And then once you have enough revenue, go after the rest of the dreams. Dream bigger, look, look towards the future, make the app cube, but you have to fund it somehow. Otherwise, you're just constantly looking for investments, which makes you change your job and what makes you change what you do every day because I'd be pitching the app cube then and saying hey how can we bring money in versus generate revenue fund the company then reinvest it and I still own it all because I just decided to um, simplify the scope Okay, so yeah, I wanted this presentation to be a little bit longer, but I decided to cut it off at like where we ended in, um, at Christmas. So the question is basically like how we're scaling it now, like how are we, what, what are our marketing efforts now? Um, the first thing I have noticed is my brother-in-law didn't buy it for Christmas. He's a doctor and he didn't buy it for Christmas, not because he didn't like it, but because he was so jam-packed, he just couldn't order it. Um, and 
I said, all right, well, let's just start emailing people that haven't ordered it that I know for a fact would support us. And so we're just emailing them and we're just saying, hey, we know you support us and I know you need to give out birthday gifts or something like that soon or, you know, Christmas gifts are eventually. Are you willing to, you know, buy some of these, support us and have these gifts? And so people are like, yeah, totally, absolutely. And so that's how we started picking up marketing and it's just like directly mailing people that we know, not even MailChimp, I mean, just like a personal email to people and then you you say okay you got that that close warm circle around you 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 you've kind of burned that out you've gotten enough money from those people to stabilize the company now you can venture out and figure out where the actual audience sits and where the actual audience plays and so what we're doing is we're just going to all these different um, game listing sites and asking them to list our our game and in addition we're going to different meetups again that have you know over 20 people and seeing if they'll just play the game and you start finding where these people are literally playing you go on youtube and you find who is actually talking about games and you start sending out freebies and i do want to caution against giving out things for free or buying ads if my mom had to buy one why should will we get one for free seriously uh, i don't know him so you have to look at it from the point if you give one out for free, is that person going to bring you back significantly more revenue? Obviously, that's the same question with ads. Most of the time with ads, I guess the average cost per whatever um, for ads is like 18 bucks. T-cubes, 15 bucks. Ads don't make sense. And it doesn't generate the same type of genuine traction. And so what we found is just saying, hey, cousin, I know that you have a group of friends who likes playing games. Would you be willing to ask just five of them to come look at our site? And then if those friends like it, see if you can get their emails and ask them. And seriously, email marketing and Facebook for us and just Twitter talking about it and talking about like Orange Line radio, radio and stuff just continually promotes T cubed because we're genuinely interested in, in um, helping people enjoy life, if that makes sense. So I should also, let me, let me add this one too. So I, I retweet a lot of stuff that they put on Twitter, not because I want them to, to notice me, but because I genuinely like what they do. And I feel that if you start targeting people on Twitter or Facebook who can only benefit you, and then you quickly ask them for something, they're so suspicious of it, they're just not going to help you. But with SAC Indie Arcade, I just passed out flyers and um, just said, hey, is there anything I can do to help you actually put this on? Because I, th I think it's a really cool community event. And eventually they said, hey, yeah, you've given us some cool stuff. You really support us. You're really like putting in some time on this. We had somebody cancel and we like your concept of paycheck pitch. Uh, would you like to come talk to people? And I said, yeah. And so I get a platform for that because I genuinely am interested in the community and in other people. Whereas a lot of people who are focused on their own idea and, and their own success, they do fail. They, or at least it's harder for them to succeed. Anybody else? Hey, I'm last, man. <laughs> we can do this all day. No, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sincerely interested in helping people make money off their games just because it's been a struggle for me. So ask on. So I, I, like I feel you, I genuinely do. Um, I, would, I would sum this up as there's a chicken and egg problem that people think exists. And I, for a long time, felt that this existed too. To devote more time to something you're passionate about that then you could make money on, you 
either have to like get money elsewhere so that you can jump off your job or you have to jump off your job and then fund it. It's like, what do you do first or second? And I would say what T-Cubed has taught me the most is keep your job. Just simplify what you want to do with the assets. In, in your example, um, ask what assets you could build to start generating revenue in the time you have. And continually just add different 3D assets and generate more and more and more money. And then it's gonna to get to a point where you're like, okay, maybe I don't have all the money I need to supplement the income that I'm making. However, I have the momentum and I can see this upward growth. And so I'd even say, so T-Cubed is not making the money I made at Lockheed Martin, not even close. However, it has the momentum that by the end of this year, and definitely by next year, I will definitely make more than I made at Lockheed. But that is four and a half, five years later. And it is it's not fun and super stressful. And it leads to a lot of just stress between people you know, because, you know, money doesn't, this is funny, money doesn't matter until you just are super broke, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Money only matters when you're super broke, but like until then, it's pretty fun, actually. And you can be designing all these assets for years and years that no one's using until you're like, oh, man, no one's buying this. So my recommendation for you and to my friend who was doing the trucking company, absolutely don't jump off your job. Just find, like, how much time do you think you have a week to work on it? Um, I work 40-hour a week. I try to get at least eight hours of sleep, so uh, not, not even a full seven hours to dedicate. For a week or what? Oh, for the week? Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I would say the, the day job is 40 hours. My actual content production is 80. Okay. And so I have, to, I have to sleep and go to work, and then whatever's left gets poured into that. Right. Okay, so I would say this. Um, if you only had 10 hours in a week... Because say you had kids, I don't know if you do, but if you had kids and you know, everything else was chaotic and you had to drive them around and everything, and you only had 10 hours, but you know it was your 10 dedicated hours, what asset could you develop one time, just that one asset that you could develop, that then you could take that asset and just promote it and promote it and promote it and promote it so that you can get a couple sales? So that then your next 10 hours, that's just generating you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 bucks, whatever, but then you make another asset and so on. Like what asset in your mind... Um, could do that for you. That's how I would start it. Rather than saying I have all of these expansive dreams, just focus on the little thing that you can do at the time you have. I had another question that was similar to this, which is for people that jump off that ship and they actually get to go full bore into what they want to do, um, are they more productive than the people that have two jobs? And my answer is no, because the people that have two jobs and have kids usually actually have a better ability to restrain themselves. When I jumped off Lockheed Martin, I'm like, yes, I have 90 hours a week. I can do this huge robot. Whereas while I was working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, I knew I only had 10 hours to work on it, so I had to try to simplify what I could do. So basically use the, use the day job to kind of force yourself into the, the kiss and basically just utilize the, you know, the force discipline as opposed to trying, trying to be on your own and force discipline yourself. Yeah. I, I genuinely think that'll make you happier, and I think it'll, it, it's more likely to help you succeed. And there will be a threshold, and you'll know it when, when you reach it, that the risk is low enough for you to jump off. But if you jump off and you're like, oh, my God, what did I do? Yeah, you shouldn't have done it. So it's kind of like, you know, not to make it all abstract or philosophical, but just let your instincts tell you what you need to do. Yeah. Fair enough. And revenue. Instincts and revenue. Instincts <laughs> Revenue talks. <laughs> I probably should jump in here real quick because we do have a musician coming in in nah. about 10 minutes. We're gonna, uh, ben Prunty is going to be here uh, playing some of the music from the FTL soundtrack, ah. which he composed, as well as some other very stuff. Very nice, very nice. So I probably should uh, say if there's any other questions, I'm okay. sure I know you're more than happy to talk to anybody else who may have some other questions. We probably should go ahead and wrap things up with a nice round of applause for Chris. TQ. Thank you. And big congratulations on all your success. Yeah, thank you. It's marvelous. I love listening to how you really incorporated the feedback to make the product because we kind of try to do the same thing with our show sometimes, incorporate that type of feedback into the product. So excellent. Yeah, thank you all very right. much. Thank you. All right. Well, 
that is going to do it for us here at the Voice of Geeks Network on our day here because, you know, we, we don't want to broadcast the musician because it's their music. Womp but womp. for those of you here in the house here at uh, the Sack Indie Arcade, I do want you to stick around. Four o'clock, Ben's going to be here and uh, very excited to uh, hear him perform. Uh, any last thoughts on today and uh, the event and everything? Uh, I loved hearing the talks today. I learned a lot, some really great stuff. I learned about community services I didn't even know were out there that I think are awesome for kids and stuff like that. So, I mean, among many other things. The discussions that I really enjoyed were the legalities and technical sides behind yes, it. Yes, yes. Which was a lot that I learned as a designer. Yeah. But um, I think that it's the big thing that people don't realize. And, I mean, it kind of makes me wish that maybe next year I can do one on typography and logo work. That might be fun. Like we'll the design behind a good mark. We'll have to talk to our pals. Loki, any last words from you before we wrap up here for our day? I got to play games downstairs, so that was fun. Good. Qu any quick shout-outs for some games? Um, I got to play um, more of, um, I think it was The Owl and the Rabbit or Rabbit and the Owl or something like that. Oh, that was the one that won the award last year, right? Yeah, 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 yeah and yeah. so it's it's definitely more along. It looks pretty nice, so I got to play that. And then I played um, a couple. I played a game where you're a fish that flops around. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Nice. I, I liked Lamora Racing, which I played last year. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty cool. Well, we'll talk about some more of these games on our next live episode of Orange Lounge Radio on Easter Sunday. We're going to have an, East, uh, an indie developer with us, actually. Uh, um, Lil T the developers from Lil Tanks which just came out on Steam this past week, is going to be here. So cool. very excited to um, welcome them on Sunday the 16th, if I have my calendar right in my head. I on the it next might be the 17th. So you just... Know, you, I can't math. You know how it goes. Every Sunday night, 6 Pacific, 9 Eastern, at the Voice Geeks Network, vognetwork.com. But not tomorrow, because we did this today. Yeah. So I want to thank, of course, the IGDA for having us here. Gabe, Bree... Love those two. Uh, everybody else helping in putting on today's event. Thank you to all our talented speakers. And thank you guys for listening. But that's it. We're, we're going to go in the internet space. But y'all in the physical space, come on back for Ben's concert here starting shortly. Yep. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.